Welcome to Living 4D with Paul Check. Today's guest is Scalar Light researcher Tom Palladino. Hello, everybody. Welcome to Living 4D with Paul Check. Today, our guest is Tom Palladino, and our title is Scalar Light for Rapid Healing. Tom Palladino is a scalar energy researcher based in Florida. He's an independent researcher, which is very important. It means he is not influenced by anyone else's money. He's an inventor, and he's the inventor of advanced scalar light technologies. Since I recorded the podcast with Tom on September the 27th, my family and I have been subscribed to his scalar light transmission on a daily basis, which he conducts using his incredible scalar light generator that projects light into a photograph of the subject and reaches you non-locally through the scalar field. I distinctly remembering the feeling when Tom activated the scalar light technology for me and my family because it felt as though the sun was sitting in my solar plexus region, and it still does, and it feels like the sun just shining right through me. Now, it's not a disturbing energy or a buzzy energy like coffee or a stimulant. It's like a, it really feels like I'm laying outside on my pool deck in a beautiful sunny environment and just the feeling of sun on your skin and how nice that feels. Angie noticed that within the first day of the scalar light transmission, she was experiencing a die-off reaction, which could have been bacteria or parasites that she didn't realize she had, but it cleared quickly, and then she also experienced the uplifting energy that I'm experiencing. So I can tell you from personal experience that the scalar light transmission definitely does work, and as Tom shares in this podcast, clears pathogens from the body and is a smooth, uplifting energy that vitalizes you. I was very impressed with Tom's depth of knowledge on scalar energy, scalar light, and the physics and quantum physics that explain both the technology and how it's possible to transmit scalar light and energy to an individual at a distance. As you will hear in this podcast, I asked him some very pointed investigative questions, the kind of questions many promoting what sounds like magic tricks or magic bullets don't answer and often gloss over quickly, and he was very clear and thorough in his responses, which I was very impressed with. In this podcast, Tom and I get into the following issues, just so you kind of have a sense of where we're going. What scalar energy and scalar light are and the physics of how it is generated and can be used for healing. Some of the history of scalar light research and technology and the expert he was mentored by. How scalar energy or scalar light provides an ordering influence in the universe. How our concept of mind relates to scalar waves which I found very interesting. The importance of diet and lifestyle factors in combination with scalar light support and why that is important regardless of what supplement or subtle energy technologies one is using. How scalar energy is not classified as electromagnetic and what it is as a specific energy form and what other forms of energy he is aware of that are outside the four fundamental forces of classical physics. I asked Tom if he feels there may be any extraterrestrial civilizations using scalar technologies or even that have been here using them in the past, so that was an interesting conversation. We talked about scalar light treatment and how to distinguish its effectiveness beyond the placebo effect. I asked him about the many different programs he has for all sorts of disorders because I wondered what modifications he has to make and how he transmits the scalar light based on specific challenges people are having. I found Tom to be well-educated, informed, and an honest man with a lot to offer all of us. And as I shared earlier, I could definitely feel the positive benefits of being a recipient of Scalar Light through Tom's broadcast subscription. And I'd encourage all of you to engage his free 15-day trial. You have nothing to lose, and from my experience, a lot of positive benefits to gain. Enjoy Tom Palladino and learning about Scalar Energy and Scalar Light as a healing option anyone can use and benefit from very cost-effectively. Enjoy. Hello, everybody. Welcome to Living 4D with Paul Check. Today, I have a very, very interesting guest, Tom Palladino, who is a very interesting man. He is a researcher, an energy researcher who researches scalar energy, and he is the inventor of advanced scalar light technologies. And today, we're going to talk about scalar light for rapid healing. And our goal here is to really help you understand what scalar energy and scalar light is, how it can be used for healing, and Tom's going to give you a free 15-day trial to test it out so you have a zero risk and maximum opportunity to heal whatever could be ailing you. So, Tom, welcome to Living 4D. 
Thank you so much for the invitation, Paul. Thank you. Yes. Uh, like I was saying to you before we started recording, somebody out there in in the world of uh, interesting people sent me information about you and said, you really ought to have this guy on your podcast. And as I said, I get that all the time, but I always look into the people. And when I looked into what you were doing, because of my background as a healer, shaman, energy worker, researcher, I immediately saw Scalar and said, okay, I want to see what this guy's up to. And, and my snooping around made me say, ah, I've got to interview this guy. So thanks for coming on. I'd love it if you can share your journey into researching scalar energy technologies and what became important enough for you to, to devote yourself to it. Thank you again for the invite. Uh, what are we going to speak about? Scalar energy, scalar light. What is that? Oh, everybody's an expert in this field. It's sunlight or starlight. <laughs> Not electricity. It's the other spectrum of energy. Now, just to, to have a, this foundational tenor, Scalar energy is chi, prana, or consciousness. Some, some scientists call it torsion energy or zero-point energy. So it's, it's pertinent to realize that there's two energies, electricity, magnetism, electromagnetic energy, and scalar energy. I've made a career out of studying scalar energy, which is the, if you will, still an esoteric subject, and, and hopefully will not be esoteric um, within the next five to ten years. Well, it's not, excuse me, it's not esoteric to the military. Yeah, you're right. You're right. This is, this is advanced technology. And why hasn't the general uh, public heard about this technology? Well, in so many, so many words, it's suppressed. It's suppressed technology. So my opening statement is I am a scalar energy researcher. I've developed scalar energy instruments that can do incredible things. I'm all about performance, and I'll, I'll share with you the audience as to how I can perform with these instruments. Well, great. Um, you know, uh, in your bio, it says my instruments promote a remote, fast, harmless, and painless treatment process that has successfully healed patients with HIV, AIDS, Ebola, herpes, hepatitis, Lyme disease, and over 400,000 pathogens that cause disease. They administer scalar energy, reverse phase angle, harmonic of a pathogen, thereby causing the agent of infection to disassemble or fall apart. Bacteria, viruses, fungi, protozoa can all be disassembled, representing a cure for thousands of diseases. Once the causative agent of a pathogen, uh, pathogen disease has been eliminated, the symptoms associated with that infection uh, disease or disease disappear altogether. Now, so the one thing I, I want to ask you about that, I understand these technologies. And as you know, there's all sorts of miracle technologies out there. And I've had a long string of patients that have brought them to me, even though <laughs> they're still having problems. And I've worked with the Rife Generator and, and many other things. But how do we get past the issue that you may have, uh, let's say, a parasite infection or a fungal infection? But those things are almost always the byproducts of beliefs, behaviors, and therefore programming and lifestyle factors. How do you address those issues once you've healed someone so they don't just go right back into it and become a scalar light junkie? Yeah, good for you. Um, and that's a great point. So I believe in holistic healing, spiritual healing, cognitive healing, emotional healing, physical healing. Everything has to factor in. And if anything, I would like people after they try our 15 day free sessions simply to say to themselves, I'm going to make an attempt to practice better hygiene. I want to improve my diet. I want to exercise. I want a better, better frame of mind. And I'm going to take self care steps. I'm going to be uh, mindful that I am responsible for my health. That's one of the obstacles that we have to overcome today in today's society. Let's to give an example, junk food. Why are we eating junk food? It's terrible. Yeah, that's why it's called junk. <laughs> Don't eat junk food. It's that simple. When you go to the supermarket, buy nutritious food. Buy, buy food that is nutrient dense. Well, what is my point? I, I would hope that, uh, yes, I can spur people on, that I can encourage people to, to a healthy lifestyle. But they, they have to agree. They have to give their, their agreement and to work hand in hand with it. 
Uh, now, just to support that, in case any of your listeners end up, or your your followers end up listening to this podcast, which I hope they do, uh, on my YouTube channel, which is youtube.com forward slash Paul, C-H-E-K live, I have about 730 something videos all dealing with these issues. And a couple that I'll recommend is your COVID-19 protection plan, which goes into exactly the things that are necessary to prevent reoccurring illnesses that are unnecessary. And the fastest way to health is another one that I have that's very clear and defines the six foundation principles of nutrition, hydration, sleep, breathing, thinking, and movement as foundational principles. And all of those are really excerpts of my book, How to Eat, Move, and Be Healthy, which I'd be happy to send you a copy of, Tom. I think you'd dig it from based on what you've just said. So can you describe what scalar light is and the difference between scalar light and standing waves, such as the Schumann resonance? Sure. It's, it's very simple. All energy originates from the stars, the sun of our solar system, the stars. So that's the point of origin of energy, of light. And all energy initiates a scalar energy. That's what powers the stars. And therefrom, many times, scalar energy will degrade or convert into electromagnetic energy. It's so simple. So the initial energy of the universe, the life force energy, is scalar energy, scalar light. And that's my preference. I want to work with that initial energy, scalar energy. I do not want to work with the secondary energy, the derivative, which is electromagnetic energy. Why? Because scalar energy is really the fundamental energy of the universe. Electromagnetic energy is not fundamental. It's a subset of, of scalar energy. So if you want to have fundamental control over nature, you have to go back to the fundamental energy, which is scalar energy. What am I getting at that? Well, any invention, any technology that we use, the purpose of that technology is in to some way to subdue nature or to control nature or to produce a favorable outcome. Well, I can control nature, if you will, quite readily with scalar energy as opposed to electromagnetic energy. So why not hit the nail on the head, so to speak, and uh, control nature by way of scalar energy, which is really the fundament of, of our universe. That is the fundamental energy, scalar energy. Could you describe what produces scalar energy? You know, because, for example, if we look at quantum physics, are you familiar with David Bohm's implicate order and explicate order? No, oh, sir. No. Okay. So the implicate is the infolded, invisible, immeasurable, which is basically scientifically said to be that which is behind the Planck scale that's essentially immeasurable because it's a zero point. Yes. And then you have the emergence of all forms of energy from that zero point. I'm wondering if you have any concept of how scalar energy is produced, because if it's there, it has to be produced. Yeah, that, that's a great point. And to answer that question in one word, God. Who produces scalar energy? God. So, so, source. What? Yeah, source. Why do I say that? Well, in order to have a, a cause, you, you, you have to have something behind that cause. And eventually, if you keep looking at what is the cause, what is the cause, eventually you're going to run out of... of uh, that trail has to end with an uncreated being. Do you understand what I'm getting at? So source. God, some people call it source, divine source, divine energy. It has to be uncreated. Because if you look at a cause and effect relationship, you always say, well, what, what was the cause of that? So as far as my viewpoint of the universe, the universe has an uncreated supreme being. I call that supreme being God which nothing precedes that. So scalar energy is produced, created by God, and this is a divine energy. Now, I can defend that statement in a number of ways. Scalar energy is omnipresent. It's everywhere in the universe. It means it's non-local. Exactly. It's non-local. It's omnipresent. And, and that is not the case of electricity, where electricity, electromagnetic energy, by way of a frequency, travels. Well, scalar energy pre-exist everywhere. Furthermore, scalar energy never dies. There's no uh, decay of signal. The, the signal is constant. Well, if it's a constant signal, then it's a, a eternal signal. Meaning what? There has to be an eternal God to produce an eternal signal. So if you look at all 
really the, 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 the characteristics of scalar energy, it really shows itself to be a divine, infinite energy. And I would assume, hopefully I'm correct, that when you're using the word God, you're not using it in a religious term like a Christian, Islamic, or Jewish God, or any other God. You're talking about pure source, that for which there is no other. Now, let's, my, my de- definition of God is a supreme being, but I defer to everybody's religious beliefs, etc. But I would say there has to be a, a prime mover in this universe without creation without a cause behind that. So there is an uncreated God, if you will. Yeah. And that fits totally with the philosophy that I teach through the Institute and all the research I've done. It's just that science doesn't use that word. They use zero, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> which, which I think is cool because then we don't have to get into religious battles. We can just keep it right there uh, at a sort of a, a mutu- mutually um, easy to work with concept. Uh, so I won't push that one further because because I what, what I've done is having interviewed many scientists such as Irvin Laszlo and Walt Thornhill, the chief uh, scientific advisor for the Electric Universe Project and, and various others, I've asked, you know, you're talking about measurements of energy in space or in the electric universe, there's just, you know, massive, massive amounts of electricity that they're calculating in stars and galaxies. And I say, well, what is the potential? Where is it coming from? And they all say, we don't know. So what you're saying is there's obviously an intelligence behind it all. And that intelligence is the source of scalar energy and all other energies, which brings up another question. Is in your principle or in your concept, is scalar energy the foundation from which the other forms of energy, such as electromagnetism, uh, gravity, weak, fo- weak nuclear, strong nuclear. Is it is it the mother of them? Yes, it's it's the uh, it, it is the supreme energy of the universe. I'm glad you asked that question. I believe scalar energy is the cause, for instance, of gravity. There was an incredible uh, Russian scientist, Viktor Gorbenikov, and he created the scalar energy flying platform, and he was able to levitate and and uh, uh, move about it at terrific speeds within this scalar energy environment, which was anti-gravity. Now, how did he do that? By subduing, by controlling scalar energy. That is, scalar energy is the cause of gravity. Viktor Gorbenikov could control scalar energy, hence he could overcome gravity. What is my point? Gravity is, is one of the subsets, if you will, of scalar energy. Gravity is controlled by scalar energy. Scalar energy is the cause of all phenomena. And gravity is simply one of the effects of scalar energy. Yes. Interesting. Uh, You know, when I hear you talk, it just makes me have a million other questions, but I'm going to try to stick to the list of questions I had so we can get through it. Because I think I've hit all the key points that are important for people to think about. So um, what is the difference between scalar light and uh, scalar waves and standard light? now, uh, some of these things I already know the answers to, but I want to ask you these questions for the listeners because they may have these questions. And a lot of the people that listen to my podcast are very deep people. They're not shallow people. They're, they're, too, they're, they're too smart to go get poked in the arm. Oh, <laughs> God bless them for that. Okay, let, let's define our terms. Scalar energy, scalar wave, scalar light. Let's say that that is the initial energy of the universe. And if you look at its composition, it's a double helix. Oh, great. Like a DNA. Yes, it's the identical uh, ratio and proportion to DNA. Now, I've seen a few photographs of scalar energy by way of time-lapse photography, and it is invariably a double helix with a major groove and a minor groove. And I believe that is the exact uh, ratio and proportion to DNA. Why? Because a standing scalar wave is responsible for our DNA. That is, scalar energy creates and maintains DNA. I don't think it's any coincidence that a standing scalar wave is the exact ratio and proportion to human DNA. So I would say that the, the, uh, the motif, if you will, the, the uh, foundational, uh, uh, if you will, platform for all genomic forms is formed, is created by scalar energy. So scalar energy 
is not only the the energy of the stars, it's it's responsible for our genomic forms, for our DNA. Now, if scalar energy is the initial energy of the universe, then it will degrade in many environments to electromagnetic energy. And it's so simple. Scalar energy, if it's a double helix, it will unbind the, 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 uh, the two arms or if you could say each helix will unbind and one will become electricity, the other will become magnetism. So if you take a double helix and you unpackage it, so to speak, then that can uh, convert into electricity and magnetism. Those are the two components. And then if you want to reform uh, electromagnetic energy back into the double helix, you simply take the electricity and magnetism negate those, and what you have is then the standing wave, the double helix. So what am I saying? Scalar energy is bidirectional. You can convert scalar energy to electromagnetic energy and, and vice versa. You can take electromagnetic energy and convert it back into scalar energy. And this is, is seen throughout the universe, and it is a benign process, and it has to be benign, without any heat, without any thermic expression. Otherwise, the universe would burn up because scalar energy is always converting frequently to electromagnetic energy throughout the universe. And if there was any violence, if there was any display of heat or any display, any thermic reaction, the entire universe would be on fire. That's not the case. So it's a benign process. And to give people a handle on it, You've seen this before, Paul. People will have a jacket, and the jacket is reversible. Make that jacket and just reverse it, and you have a different color on the inside and a different look. Well, that's that's probably one of the best analogies that I can give you with scalar energy, that you just reverse that, that jacket, so to speak, and you can change from scalar to electromagnetic energy or go back from electromagnetic energy into scalar. So the, the two um, work hand in hand. My preference is to work with the superior energy, the initial energy, which is scalar energy. This is so simple. This is a fundament, sadly, that many physicists have lost or, or never could quite attend to. Well, this brings up a question that I think is going to be very important for everybody listening. I see the DNA as two things, a waveguide to direct energy and an antenna to pick up all the frequencies that make a human being what it is, which are basically in my observation and spiritual investigations into what they call junk DNA is actually the biological record of our evolution through nature, which is why when they do an analysis of human DNA, they find that we have, for example, almost many of the same DNA as a fruit fly, a banana, and almost everything out there. So we have all that in us, but those things are the interface between what we would call our spirit, soul, and our physical body, which is a product of nature. So here's the big question. If you start introducing an mRNA synthetic vaccine, are you not going to alter that very elaborate DNA structure, waveguide antenna that has been evolving for billions of years to maintain a critical interface with our natural survival systems in such ways that we are playing Russian roulette. We are playing Russian roulette, and I'm glad you bring up that point. So messenger RNA, this is a synthetic genomic form. It's man-made. And when you're introducing that into our, into our biome, into our human body, our human body does not recognize that synthetic material. It's a man-made molecule. And, and we, I, I predict, and many mystics have shared this with me, that the future is really foreboding with this synthetic messenger RNA in our body. It will change our DNA. And many mystics, many mystics have told me that. Now, I want to make this very clear. That's not a scientific comment on my part. Many mystics that I work with have, have been told by God that this is going to wreak havoc on our DNA. So that is the future being foretold by way of mysticism. Now, only time will tell just how deleterious this synthetic messenger RNA is. But it just stands to reason. If, if you look at a, an experiment with genetically modified food, 
I don't know where you stand, people, uh, on the uh, what side of the fence, but I think genetically modified food is wrong. It is wrong. Everybody listening is with you, unless they're unless they've just found my podcast and they've just come out of Bill Gates's most recent party and they're ready to eat garbage for the rest of their life. Uh, I've looked at piles of research on genetic modification. And all the initial research studies from all over the world show that it deformed organs, brains. It basically screwed every animal up that they tested it on. And here we have Mr. Gates trying to pump it into the entire world. And so, uh, you're, uh, uh, you know, my audience is very holistic. Most of them are Czech professionals, advanced healers, doctors. So uh, just know you're talking to people that are already deeply aware. So feel free to fire away. Okay, so to cut to the chase, um, the man-made proteins produced by genetically modified food, this, this has been established, has, have caused many medical conditions, many medical problems. Now, to some extent, are we looking at that same trajectory with the synthetic messenger RNA? Many people project so. I, I do, at, at least after listening to the mystics and respecting what the prophecies are. Many people who have taken these vaccines, if they are contaminated, then we will see some type of uh, uh, chronic medical condition evolve. Exactly what? I don't know. N nobody knows. <laughs> the injury toll and the death toll is sort of speaking for itself. Right. It, it is. It is. And, and we, we, can't, we can't ignore this. And I don't know why there's not an up, uh, uproar over this. I, I'm, I'm a, I, everybody I speak to, I tell them, don't take the vaccine. It's unproven, and, and and it's already producing deleterious side effects. You know, just wait, see see what happens. But you know, that's we're not we're not the majority here. Paul. No, it's sad, but you know, that's just goes to show you the power of the media for brainwashing people. And without a long trip down a rabbit hole, uh, you know, I say they might be very for it now. But when there's so many people dead and seriously injured, they're going to realize they've been seriously duped and it's going to cause a backlash that's going to rapidly elevate consciousness on this planet. And unfortunately, I think we've gotten so trapped into unconscious behaviors and beliefs that are not in harmony with nature that we've brought this on ourselves as a, shall we say, the awakening of our shadow to bring us back into harmony with nature. Or the Hopi prophecy gets to be uh, dangerously um, real in the sense that if we don't get back to harmony with nature, they're, they're, I don't know if you've seen the drawing on the rock of the Hopi prophecy, but it comes to a dead end unless we come back into harmony with nature. Yeah, if, if, if you are against war with nature, nature is going to win. I, I always give this analogy to people. It might be a crude analogy, but I think it's quite telling. Many people are very scrupulous about the fuel that they put in their car. They want a high octane or they, they want fuel that's really going to be conducive to the proper uh, mechanics, the proper uh, 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 behavior, if you will, of their motor. Well, that's obviously fuel for the car. Why is it that people are more scrupulous about the, the, the gasoline that they put in their engine than they are about the food in their body? That makes no sense whatsoever. No, but common sense has turned out to be a rare commodity today, or we wouldn't even have to have this discussion, would we? Yeah, it's a shame. Do I say this on many podcasts? Please do not eat junk food. I, I don't. I don't know what those man-made chemicals are per se. I'm not a chemist, and I, I don't have any long-standing tests to, to prove what those man-made chemicals will do, including genetically modified food. My wife and I never eat genetically modified food ever. Never. Well, the good news is, is there's thousands and thousands of research papers and countless books. I mean, I, I could keep people reading for five years just on what's in my library on all these issues. So it's, you know, sometimes we just have to trust that uh, great spirit is willing to explore anything. I'll tell you something, you know, um, I was in deep meditation one day with connecting to great spirit. And I said, why is it that you're constantly trying to kill yourself? Meaning everything we're talking about. You want to hear the answer I got back? Yeah. I can't. I got it, right? It, 
it, in other words, the message was, no matter what you see going on, it never kills the truth of what you are, but in order for a source to know itself, it has to explore both ends of the polarity spectrum, and without positives and negatives, we can't have consciousness, so the answer is, is that it's all about choice, and, and whatever choices we make determines the experience we have, and that is fed back into the universe as information about itself. I think what we're trying to do is say to people, you don't have to take the negative path. You can choose happiness, health, and vitality, and that's all good, too. <laughs> it's cheaper, too. Uh, you're right. I, I see so much suffering, and so much of this is avoidable. It's, it's I, you know, I... It just pains me to see mankind going down this route. And it's the hard way. It's the difficult way. It is. I have a new video about to be released called Why Kings Kill Your Children. I think it's going to be quite a shocking wake-up call for people. You know, turmeric's really, really hot now. There's a lot of scientific research on it. But they're not all created the same, so I brought Autumn Smith on to tell you about Paleo Valley's turmeric complex so you know exactly what the benefits are and why you, like me, should get your turmeric complex from Paleo Valley. Autumn, tell us about your turmeric complex. At Paleo Valley, we are big believers in food as medicine. And so turmeric, of course, it has beat drugs out. We know it's anti-inflammatory. We know it has brain benefits. We know it has joint benefits. But what most people don't know is that a lot of turmeric supplements only contain one isolated compound of turmeric called curcumin. And so what we did instead was create a complex. We added organic turmeric and then ginger and rosemary and clove, which were some of the most DNA protective spices studied. And we created a complex. We added organic coconut powder and pepper for absorption. And so we've created a really high quality, highly bioavailable turmeric complex that will hopefully help you to feel your best. And all you have to do to check it out is go to paleovalley.com. That's P-A-L-E-O-V-A-L-L-E-Y.com. And you can use the code CHECK15, that's lowercase C-H-E-K-15 to save 15%. Um, my next question is, do scalar waves have specific frequency ranges, bandwidths, and do they oscillate? Scalar energy is a pulsation. That's a good point. I don't call it a frequency because per se, it's not a sinusoidal wave. I use the term expression or direction or instruction or harmonic. So it has an infinite number of instructions. If it's from God, it's it's divine source. It's infinite. It's infinite intelligence. Hence, it has infinite instructions. Remember what I'm saying. If this energy is capable of infinite instructions, well, then it, it will instruct our universe. And that, I believe, is what it does. Some people have used this term before, uh, the Akashic record or the matrix or the the universal cloud or the mind of the Holy Spirit, all of those terms are synonymous, meaning there is a universal information system, and that is scalar energy. And that is what I'm tapping into. Love it. I was studying some of physicist John Mitchell Mullen's work, and he mentioned that scalar waves do not come from any direction. How are scalar waves or scalar light propagated? For example, the sun's light travels in waves as it emanates from the sun. So does scalar uh, light travel? You kind of answered this, but I wanted to ask the question just to see if you want to elaborate more. Does it travel in rays or is it distributed differently? It's omnipresent. It, there is no point A and point B with scalar energy. It exists. It's omnipresent instantaneously. So it is really the true matrix system of the universe. It's not dependent upon time and space. It transcends time and space. So it pre-exists everywhere. And you simply find your way into that paradigm, and then you can exchange information instantaneously. When I'm working with my scalar energy instruments, there is no point A and point B. There is no traveling of energy, scalar energy from two points. It's an instantaneous communication, meaning what? Once I'm into that paradigm, that dimension, you, you can leave time and space behind. Time and space are not relevant. So if Einstein developed the theory of relativity, the theory of scalar energy is the theory of, of absoluteness. Now, 
what this brings up in me is a curious question that I hope you can answer because I'd love to hear the answer to this one. How does scalar energy correlate to what Einstein thought had to be there called the ether? You know, Einstein never quite grasped the ether as opposed to Tessa. Tessa spoke uh, frequently about ether. Now, what is ether? It depends on how you term that, but there has to be some type of medium, some type of way that this information propagates. And whether ether is, is considered to be scalar energy or some type of small particle, you know, it depends on who, you, who, who you're speaking with. But I do believe that there is an ether. I do believe that, that the fundamental energy of the universe, which is scalar energy, is massless. And hence, you have to have something of mass, some matter that is uh, measurable, if you will, which perhaps in my estimation it would be ether. So scalar energy is the fundamental massless energy, whereas ether is the mass, the, the, the primordial mass of the universe. Yes, yeah, so it it uh, sounds to me like if we had an equation that the ether would be the first fundamental note, if you thought of it musically, or it would be the basic building block out of which everything else comes from one step removed from scalar energy. Yeah, I, yeah. Let me let me restate something. In order to have a universe, something has to be fundamental, meaning it's not divisible. You, it, there, nothing precedes it. So I believe scalar energy is the fundamental energy. Nothing precedes it, and I believe ether or this this small particle is the fundamental particle, and it's not divisible. So nothing precedes it. So what am I getting at? The proton and the electron are divisible. They're not fundamental. They're charged. I believe yeah, you can you can break apart a proton, a neutron, and an electron. What am I getting at? Protons, electrons, and neutrons are composed of ether. Ether is the smallest physical form. Okay. Now, you've talked about scalar light coming from stars, but I'm curious, uh, do you have any thoughts on whether it emerges from black holes or are there other sources, maybe white holes or other sources? It, it depends on how we def define black holes, but just consider this. What gives the energy to a black hole? It's in, even though it's a, it might be a dying star or a star that's receding, it's still infinite energy. And if you look at the universe, trillions of galaxies, trillions of galaxies. Well, if that was electromagnetic energy, sooner or later we would run out of electromagnetic energy. So what's my point? The, the fundament of the universe is scalar energy. If you go to the center of every star, you're not going to have a thermonuclear reaction. You're going to have scalar energy. And there's a great scientist, uh, uh, Nikolai uh, Kozarev, a Russian astrophysicist, and he concluded that there's no nu thermonuclear reaction inside a star. It's scalar energy that's driving that star. And once that scalar energy leaves the star, then you might have a thermonuclear reaction. You, then you might have these solar flares. But if you go right back to the center of the star, it's pure scalar energy. That's quite profound. Yes. Are you familiar with Rudolf Steiner? Yes. Steiner, in one of his books, said, if you could see the inside of a star, it would surprise you because it would look like you were standing in the middle of a giant spherical mirror. Yes, it's holographic. It's it's a perfect hologram inside a star, which is perfect scalar energy. And when you're there, it, it's benign. If you and I were to travel inside the center of the sun of our solar system, we could we could exist easily. It's a benign atmosphere. It's only when scalar energy starts to degrade into electromagnetic energy that you have a great deal of heat and fire, so to speak. So the degradation of the scalar energy must be essential to the creation of nature, or it wouldn't happen. Yes, correct. Yes, you're right. Uh, so there's two energies that drive the, the universe, scalar energy and its derivative, electromagnetic energy. But we have to consider everything initiates with scalar energy. Now, um, my next question, I, I realize it looks like a statement. Uh, it's from your bio. You had an interesting sentence that uh, I say here sets up a question. You say, 
Subsequently, all spiritual, cognitive, emotional, and physical action in the universe is initiated and maintained by scalar energy instructions. Scalar energy provides order in the universe. So what that's setting me up to ask you is, what is mind in your conception? What is it and how does it function? And is it thought or thought action that's mediated by scalar waves? I would say mind, the human mind, is really composed of this scalar wave. It, it is scalar energy. So if, if any process of thinking is really a scalar wave emanation, um, if, if you've ever looked at the great geniuses, those men and women that had this, this acute ability, they had scalar energy gifts. Yeah, I don't know if you ever remember the movie Rain Man. Lawrence. Yeah, of course, yes. Lawrence Kim Peek was actually was a, was a sovereign who could memorize a book in an afternoon. How do you do that? He had a scalar energy memory. What am I getting at? If you have a scalar energy mind, you, you can achieve incredible mathematical computation, incredible memorization feats. My point being is scalar energy is the fundament. Scalar energy is, is the very cause of our thinking. That's what I'm getting at. Yes. Now, if you... This gets a bit technical, but let's dance with it a little bit. Um, for mind to function at any level, you have to have a subject-object duality. There's always a perceiver and something being perceived. So if scalar energy is the fundamental, we'll call that the subject, the degradation into the electromagnetic forces, gravity, and everything else gives us something to observe, which would then create the subject-object relationship. So from what you're sharing, it seems to me that mind, i.e. big mind, the mind of the universe, may be the relationship between scalar energy and its degradation into other forms, which we call life. I, I think that's a pretty profound thought. I've never thought of it that way. Um, again, if scalar energy is the fundament of the universe, the initial energy of the universe, and many times we sense our, our, our sense, what we, what we can actually see or hear or, or taste, that really is an electromagnetic experience um, in many ways, then maybe, maybe that's a great way of looking at it then, that the higher instructs the lower, so to speak. That's a, that's a good point. Because if scalar energy is intelligence and it's non-local, the degradation into the energies that we know of from the laws of physics that we've been talking about would create objects. Therefore, that would be how God could experience itself, thus mind. Yeah, that's a matter of perception, and you're right. Um, I, I do believe there are two energies in the universe, scalar and electromagnetic, and people possess both those dimensions. Sadly, that if you read a scientific textbook that only considers the electromagnetic spectrum, that, that's one of the faults of our physics books today. But nonetheless, both play a part, a role in our, in our lives. Yes. What is the mechanism by which we absorb and utilize scalar light? And why is it that people need external sources from manufactured scalar light or scalar wave technologies instead of just absor absorbing it? from the environment or the sun and do practices like Tai Chi, yoga, Qigong and others uh, improve scalar energy absorption? Yeah, good, good point. I, I have a scientifically built scalar energy instrument and I tell people, don't be jealous of me because you have a mind and a heart and the mind, the human mind and the human heart are far exceed my capability with my scientific instrument. So one of the points I try and make with people is, look, if I can prove to you I can do this with an instrument, imagine what you can do so much more with the mind and with the heart. What am I getting at? Again, going back to our earlier statement, our thinking is a scalar energy thought and our emotion are scalar energy emotions, meaning what? Scalar energy instructions to think, scalar energy instructions to feel, to, to emote, so to speak. And that far exceeds any instrument that man can, can create. So it, you've heard this so many times, think good thoughts, think positive thoughts, be good people, be heartful, be, be compassionate. All of that is so important to our daily, to our daily lives. If, we, if everybody would practice that, it would be paradise on earth. Well, 
<clears throat> I'm going to share a Steiner quote with you that you may not have heard. Forgive my audience. Audience, forgive me for repeating this quote, which you've heard me repeat probably eight times now. But I think you'll find it fascinating, Tom. Steiner said, man will continue to invent technologies outside of himself until he either destroys the world or realizes that all the technologies he's invented are inferior copies of what is inside of him. Exactly. Exactly. Thank you. you know, I'm not recreating the universe. I, I'm simply imitating the universe. And that's one of the things I'm trying to inculcate in, in my work. Scalar energy is the fundament of the universe. And many times I encourage people, look, you can participate in scalar energy. Eat some vegetables. Those vegetables, <laughs> are, those vegetables are storehouses of scalar energy. Pray. I tell people frequently to pray. I, I have a Christian background. What is prayer? It's the analog of scalar energy. Yeah. I, I, and, and, you know, there's the old saying, be careful what you pray for because your thoughts are a very powerful creative force. And if God is unconditional love, then the answer to every prayer is yes. So it's important to be very conscious that you are praying for things that are not only good for you, but they're good for everybody. Because if the answer is yes, you always have to get yourself back. Jung said the unconscious always meets you from the outside until you meet it on the inside. So the events of the world in Jungian psychology are our unconscious meeting us from the outside inspiring us to meet it on the inside, heal, and become more harmonious with the laws and principles of life and nature. At least that's my viewpoint. Now, are there other civilizations on Earth in the past that have used scalar technologies from what you know of? You know, that's, that's hard to say. You know, many people have said that they've seen uh, petroglyphs that, that depict certain types of scalar energy instruments. So. I don't know. I, I, I could not say yes or no to that. It, as far as the modern day is concerned, uh, it was Nikola Tesla. Nikola Tesla was the first man to develop scalar energy instruments. And this is how profound Tesla was. He began his career with AC electricity. He was a great electrical engineer. And he ended his career with scalar energy. The latter part of his life, he was no longer interested in electricity. And if you look at his inventions and if you look at his discoveries, he was on a scalar energy trajectory. He was no longer working with AC electricity. So he's the first, the first man that I know of to harness scalar energy. And that is so important because you can theorize about this all day long, but unless you have a functioning scalar energy instrument, it's still theory. It's not practice. Right. But he did. Yeah. He had a lot of them. Have you seen the, uh, there's a very good series on Amazon I happened to come across called the Tesla Files. Have you seen that? No, I have not. Oh, I think you'd dig it. It's an astrophysicist, an investigative journalist, and they work with teams of scientists to reproduce uh, many of the experiments that the government said Tesla was faking and was a bunch of BS and wrote a bunch of propaganda about them, but they reproduce every single one of them and show that it does work. They light bulbs hold light bulbs to their heads, to the ground, and they light up. They use uh, Tesla technology, and they powered a motorboat with no wires, which they could control, and it was a, a remote control boat going all over a lake and all sorts of very cool stuff, but they, they make it dead clear that Tesla did know what he was doing and show his experiments reproduced, and it's pretty profound. You, know, you have to compare Tesla's work at, at the end of his career and in the earlier settings where he has armatures, et cetera, et cetera. What is my point? Well, later in his life, he was working with this massless energy, scalar energy. And if you look at his tower, one of his towers in Long Island, the Wardenclyffe Tower. Yes, I've that, seen that it. Was a, that was an energy creating tower. Now, look at that very carefully. Look at those photographs. You'll notice there's no lines. There's no wires. There's no electrical wires anywhere. It was, it was intended to be a wireless transmission of energy, meaning what? Well, he left behind electricity. Electricity, you need wires. With scalar energy, he was going to power the world with this new technology that is wireless. And if you look at a lot of his latter-day inventions, there's no wires. There's no armatures. 
There's no turbines. It, it's the where's the energy coming from? The stars. Well, you know what's interesting is in the Tesla files, they travel all over the world and they do all sorts of research into documents that have been kept secret. They go to the Tesla Museum where uh, I think it's family members actually of Tesla uh, have uh, 60 something trunks of his information, but they got access to some of Tesla's uh, secret documents. And what one of the things that's quite shocking is they actually show hand-drawn plans by Tesla from about, I think, 1940 or something like that for a cell phone. And it looks exactly like the flip phones, you know, that we had before the modern phones. So it shows that Steve Jobs and none of these guys actually came up with the idea of the cell phone. Tesla had it before anybody did. Yeah, there, there's a lot of suppressed technology. And if people really knew the, the actual truth here, Many of these inventions that are in vogue today were, were indeed uh, either invented by Tesla or he at least gave the idea for their invention. Yes, I've spent a lot of time studying UFOs and extraterrestrial civilizations and related history and all sorts of stuff because uh, there's just too many findings on this planet, such as pyramids, that don't make sense from the concept of developmental man building pyramids with 100 ton blocks of stone and rolling them up 100 and something stories in the air on wooden rollers. I mean, you don't need to be very smart to go, wait a minute, <laughs> how can they be teaching stuff like that in universities and giving people PhDs for such ridiculousness? And one of the things that I found in my studies, and particularly with the work of Stephen Greer, Dr. Stephen, Stephen Greer, who's done incredible work with contact and, and the technologies is that it's sort of a question they they are they're capable and he he has footage that's mind boggling if you haven't seen um any of Dr. Stephen Greer's documentaries are incredible but there's a series on Gaia TV right now that, that recently came out with Dr. Stephen Greer it's called Disclosure with Dr. Stephen Greer and he makes it dead clear that these beings can travel interdimensionally they can make it across the galaxy almost instantaneously and that they are using technology so far beyond what we have it's unbelievable so i'm just curious if you've ever had any thoughts that maybe that's scalar energy is how they're making these long voyages because it's a hundred thousand years at the speed of light just to get out of our galaxy so if a if an extraterrestrial came from another galaxy say the edge of our galaxy that's two hundred thousand years for a round trip i mean I don't know how long they live, but you'd miss out on everything. And that's only possible when you're working in the other dimension, scalar energy dimension. You're no longer bound by time and space. I know it's difficult for some people to grasp this, but if you stay with the electromagnetic spectrum, you're, you're predicated upon that time and space and you're bound, you're shackled to time and space. You get out of that dimension. The other dimension, you can travel... Uh, but amongst galaxies, as you said, in a, in a short period of time. Now, there is one man, and I want the audience to study this man, Victor Grobenikoff. Victor Grobenikoff was an uh, um, entomologist, and he uh, studied uh, uh, insects and how insects would fly about. Grobenikoff, G-R-E-B-E-N-N-I-K-O-V. Anyway, <clears throat> Grabenikov saw that there were certain beetles that would hover, that would levitate. So he wanted to imitate those levitating beetles, if you will. And he created a flying platform under that principle to levitate, to, to experience anti-gravity. Now, when Grabenikov was on this flying platform, it was a scalar energy flying platform that experienced anti-gravity, uh, Grabenikov saw that he was out of time. Meaning what? Every time he was in this flying platform, so to speak, in this anti-gravity environment, his, his uh, wristwatch did not advance because his wristwatch did not recognize time. He transcended time. And when he was on this flying platform, he also recognized he never had any G-forces against his body. He could move about at hundreds of miles an hour 
And he had no sensation of, of gravity. Why? He was in an anti-gravity uh, cocoon, if you will. His hair would never flutter. His clothes would, would remain uh, uh, um, with, without any incidents from the elements, so to speak. So it has been done, and it's been proven by this great uh, Russian scientist, Viktor Grobenikov, that is within a scalar energy environment, you're outside of time and space, and he could move about quite, quite readily on this flying platform at hundreds of miles per hour, and that there were peculiar events that he recognized when he was in this anti-gravity environment. Um, he, he recognized that some people could not see him. He was invisible to people uh, on the earth. He recognized that many times that, that um, he was perhaps um, not able to cast a shadow um, with his flying platform because it, you're at a different perspective of light and how light interprets a flying platform. Anyway, um, what is my point? Well, there might be some analogy here between the the rudimentary work of Viktor Grobenikov with a flying platform and the, and the flying uh, instruments or the UFOs that we see today, meaning what? Meaning that gravity can be overcome. Meaning that if Viktor Grobenikov could create flying platforms, and no, it was crude, but it, nonetheless, it was the beginning of this science, and that these, these flying platforms are in a dimension outside of the electromagnetic dimension, and hence they're not subject to electricity or magnetism. Take note, take note of the work of Viktor Grobenikov. Are you familiar with Viktor Schauberger by chance? Yes, yes. Schauberger was working with scalar energy, and, and really the, the fundament that he discovered is that, that this implosion, when, you, when you're working with water or, or anything in nature, when you're working with that implosion, that produces a quasi or a real scalar energy environment. Remember, scalar energy is a double helix. And whether it's a tornado or whether it's water draining from your sink, that's that swirling, that, that rotation is a scalar wave. That's cool. Yeah, because, uh, you know, I've got all of Schauberger's books and all the books by, I think it's Callum Coates that was one of his primary people that sort of put his work together. Together, I think I have six or seven Sh of Schauberger's books on water and related phenomena. But one of them tells a story of how he was uh, captured by Hitler, put in a concentration camp, and forced at gunpoint. Hitler brought him all the top scientists he had captured and said, "You will build a flying saucer, or you will die." And Schauberger was actually with these other scientists able to build a flying saucer. And when they first tested it. It shot through the roof of the building, blew the roof off, but they, they couldn't control it. And uh, they describe how Schauberger was relieved because he was very concerned about Hit what Hitler would do if he could actually control forces of that magnitude. Yeah, you're right. You're right. Well, Viktor Grobenikov did. And if you, if you study this Russian entomologist, what a brilliant man. Sadly, Grobenikov wanted to give this invention to, to the world. But he was shunned, and in many ways, later in his life, um, he, he was it was an active a smear campaign against him. Sounds like Tesla and many others. Yeah, yeah. You see, scalar energy is a it's a different dimension. You're no longer bound to this uh, this mentality that you have to drill for oil or that that you have to work so laborious. Scalar energy will liberate mankind. It's it's a technology like none other, and this is why it's suppressed. It frees us. It's going to liberate mankind. And, and the power structure today does not want a liberated mankind. No, that's why the opposite is going on right now. The opposite, is, they're trying to cage and harvest mankind like little pigs in an electronic jail. That's what I keep telling people. Wake the hell up. All you got to do is look at what Bill Gates has patents on, and it's very obvious what's going on. I mean, this is like bad news, boys. You got girls, wake up <laughs> quick. Now, my other question in this regard is, are there other forms of energy or waves outside the electromagnetic spectrum besides scalar light or scalar energy? For example, I, I know of compression waves that are not standard waves. Are there others that you know of? 
Now, I, I always boil it down to those two classifications. The fundamental energy is scalar, and the derivative is electricity and magnetism. And that's, that's all that I've observed. And under those two energy spectrums, you could subsume, if you will, different types of, of phenomenon. But I consider there's only two energies in the universe. Well, there's also torsion waves and torsion energy. I know I've studied a lot of the Russian science on torsion waves. And interestingly, they talk about how, for example, where you're sitting right now, they say if you get out of that chair for 30 days, there will be a complete body of you with a memory of the experience you had up to that moment sitting in your chair for 30 days. But why I bring that up is because you mentioned that the scalar energy takes a double helix. And so if that energy is following a double helix, maybe that's causing the rotation that produces uh, torsion fields. Torsion energy and scalar energy are synonymous terms. Oh, good. Okay. The Russians that I've studied use that the term torsion energy is used a great deal by uh, the Russians. And I believe that's synonymous. I believe those are identical energies. Torsion energy is scalar energy. Uh, Again, Nikolai Kozarev, an incredible Russian um, scientist, um, he was able to pinpoint with a scalar energy telescope, so to speak, the exact position of the star. So what am I getting at? With, with our existing telescopes, we're looking at a star at its previous position. Our telescopes utilize electromagnetic energy to observe the previous position of a star. Are you with me here? Oh, of course. Yeah, the light from the sun takes eight minutes to get here. So if you're looking at the sun right now, you're actually looking at, at eight, a, a shadow of where it was eight minutes ago. And that's not very far away compared to other galaxies. This man, Nikolai Kozarev, was able to detect the exact immediate position of a star with a scalar energy device. So if you're going to use the, the old form, so to speak, you're going to see a star in its previous position, maybe if it's five light years away, that's the position of the star five years ago. But if you're going to use uh, Kozarev's method, you're going to use a scalar energy telescope and you'll see the exact position of the star in the universe. Hi, everybody. I've looked into magnesium supplements in my many years as a therapist and found, unfortunately, most of them are junk until the day Wade Lightheart handed me his magnesium breakthrough from Bioptimizers, which is a very, very specialized product that they did a lot of research on. Wade, I'd love it if you could tell us a little bit about what makes magnesium breakthrough so unique and so potent. Well, number one is that we realized that different types of magnesium are absorbed by different parts of the body. So we tested virtually every magnesium product there was on the market, and it came down to seven different ones that produced the best aspects or best effects over the broadest amount of people. We combine them without any weird excipients or, you know, some of the chemical agents that other companies use. We don't use any of that stuff. And we combined it with humic and fulvic acid as well as B6 to make sure that it's absorbed and utilized by the body. That's excellent. I really love it because one of the things I love about all your products is I can actually turn people on to them. They buy them. And I've never had a single person say to me, those products don't work. Everybody that I know has continued to buy Bioptimizer's products to enhance their life. Where can people get it and what's their discount? Just go to www.magbreakthrough.com slash living40 and put in your coupon code Paul10 and you get a 10% discount. And of course, everything has a 100% money back guarantee. You can't get better than that. And for a limited time, Bioptimizers is also giving away free bottles of their best-selling products, P3OM and Masszymes, with select purchases. Enjoy. Are you familiar with any mystics that are alive or in the recent past that specifically stated they were working with scalar energy? Um, I... I know of a number of mystics who've always said that scalar energy really is prayer and, and meditation. And, and even though these mystics were not scientists or they did not have the, the means to, to inquire about this with scientific instrumentation, they access that dimension through prayer and meditation. Now, I would, I would encourage everybody listening to this podcast to likewise become mystical and, and use your 
your mind and your heart to have those mystical experiences. That is your doorway to the scale energy realm, which is the which is the metaphysical realm. I'm a remote viewer, so uh, I have a lot of experience of being able to go anywhere. I've been on the sun. I've been all over the place. And believe me, what I see there is not what they tell you in textbooks and or anything like that. The point I'm bringing up, though, is that in order for me to travel in what I call my spirit body to any of these dimensions, I can't be working within the standard laws of physics. It would be simply impossible to do. Exactly. And it also says, you know, as a remote viewer who's been having these experiences since I was 12 years of age, there, there, there's another reality that emerges. If I can, through intention, ask my soul to take me to the sun and find myself not only on the sun, but talking with other beings there, that points to something profound that is simply this. The sun and everything else isn't out there. It's all one being that the, the, the personality we are or the illusion of separation between us right now is the illusion but the deeper reality is that as a remote viewer i'm not looking somewhere else i'm just looking at another aspect of myself because it's all consciousness and that's a good point there's two energies hence there's two realities and many times if if you're trying to explain nikola tesla's work the latter part of his lifestyle of his life, you cannot understand that by way of electromagnetic theory. For instance, there, some people say that there was a Philadelphia experiment. But let me set the tone here with the audience. Apparently, Tesla or other scientists were working with scalar energy instruments on a, a ship from the from uh, of the U.S. Navy, and during this scalar energy experiment. Um, there was a great deal of scale energy that surrounded the ship, and actually the ship teleported from one position to another. And, and eyewitnesses said that during this experiment, some of the sailors on the ship were interpenetrated into the hull of the ship. Now, if that's the case, and I, I think there is merit to this story, I can explain that event. It was a scalar energy event. Many times when you have a very strong scalar energy force field, uh, two physical bodies will lose their physical rigidity. They'll become almost gas-like or spirit-like. And just for an instant, those two physical forms can interpenetrate and, and fuse together. So apparently during this Philadelphia experiment, it was a scalar energy environment that was created, and the sailors were able to penetrate into the hull of the ship and become incorporated into the whole of the ship. And eyewitnesses say that they saw some sailors, they saw half of their body outside of the whole of the ship, and the other half of their body was inside the ship, incorporated inside the ship. So what is my point here? Well, when you're working in a scalar energy environment, many times you, you lose your physical rigidity or you're no longer a physical form, you're perhaps gas-like or spirit-like. And this has been proven by the Philadelphia experiment in which a number of sailors became fused or incorporated into the ship itself. Now, that's quite profound. And there's other examples in nature in which we see uh, molecular interpenetration and, and two, if you will, physical forms fusing one into another. Now, my point is the scalar energy dimension is not the electromagnetic dimension. It, the scalar energy dimension observes different laws, different principles. And it, for instance, when I'm working with my scalar energy instrument, I'm able to take the physical rigidity, if you will, of a germ, of a microbe, and break it down by that Philadelphia uh, experiment, so to speak, those those principles that guided the Philadelphia experiment. If if you can take a, a soldier, a U.S. sailor, and fuse them into the hull of the ship, well, in reverse, I can take a virus and break down the molecular integrity, the physical integrity of a virus, and the virus falls apart. And that's, if you will, the Philadelphia experiment in reverse. And I practice that on a daily basis. So there is merit to, to what I'm doing, and I believe there is merit to the stories of the Philadelphia experiment. Yeah, it brings up an interesting question. Now, 
I know you've said that scalar energy is non-local, but it brings up a question. You know, there's places on the planet like the Bermuda Triangle where things suddenly disappear, like entire ships and airplanes. So I'm wondering if, do you think there are dimensional portals where scalar energy is actually concentrated enough that if you enter these zones that you could, you know, move into a dimension shift. Yes. Uh, there have been various reports that some aircraft have entered into the Bermuda Triangle. And um, the, from the eyewitness report from the pilot, the pilot survived. The pilot entered into a spinning vortex, which is what? Scalar energy. And once the pilot with a plane now is, is entering into that spinning vortex, the pilot, the plane is out of time. It's out of space. And many of these pilots have reported that once they leave that spinning vortex, that time did not elapse while they were in the vortex. Why? Because you're outside of time. Now, remember what I said about Viktor Grebenikov, who had the flying platform, the anti-gravity platform. Every time he was on that anti-gravity platform, his wristwatch did not advance because Time does not is not recognized in a scalar energy environment. Everything is in the present moment. And many of these people that have flown into the spinning vortex in the Bermuda Triangle have likewise been outside of time. And after they leave that vortex, they see that they, there was no time lapse. There was no passage of time. Meaning what? They were probably in a scalar energy environment that is timeless. Yeah. And, you know, the other thing you're making me think of <clears throat> in my library, I have pictures of big trees that a tornado moved in the area. And I've even seen pictures of straw, like hay bale straw, driven completely into an oak tree. And they've x rayed them and dissected them and found that the straw was not broken. So that seems to be something more along the lines of scalar type activity because there's no way I don't think that I know of that you could do that with an electromagnetic force or any of the standard forces of physics because the straw would just dismantle itself. Yeah, that, that's brilliant, Paul. That's brilliant. You've done your homework. I'm proud. That's brilliant. <laughs> well, this is what I have found. I've, I've seen various photographs of um, the aftermath of very uh, intense, if you will, tornadic activity. I remember I saw a photograph from the aftermath of, of a tornado in Joplin, Missouri. And I saw that there was a garden hose fused into a tree. And prior to that, the garden hose was just laying on the ground. The garden hose had not been incorporated into the tree, meaning what? During that tornadic activity, that heavy concentration of scalar energy, <clears throat> the tree and the garden hose became, if you will, spirit-like or gas-like. And the garden hose penetrated into the tree. And then after the, the tornado passed, the garden hose was fused into the tree. Okay. Prior to the tornado, the garden hose and the tree were, were two separate physical forms. Meaning what? Some tornadoes are so strong that for a brief instant, there is a scalar energy environment that that allows two physical objects to interpenetrate. And then after the tornado passes, those two physical forms lock in place, they interpenetrate, they fuse together. And as you said, in the aftermath of some tornadoes, people have seen straws incorporated into a tree. Now a straw is obviously very weak, but that straw did not have any degradation. It did, did not splinter, it did not fracture. How do you put a straw into a tree without compromising the straw. Well, you do it through a scalar energy event in which those two physical forms become, if you will, non-rigid or, or almost gas-like for a brief, a brief moment. Or like an energy archetype that merges, two, two things merging to create one. Going back to the Philadelphia experiment in which the, the sailors were incorporated into the hull of the ship. You know, the, the documentary that I found, which I'll, I'll make sure we put in the show notes on scalar energy from the physicist that I mentioned earlier um, that you knew about, uh, shows some very interesting things. He shows United States fighter jets 
flying faster than the speed of sound with clouds above the wings covering the whole top of the airplane that are not moving, even though the jet's traveling at mock this or mock that, which would be physically impossible in a normal uh, standard physics environment. He also shows a U.S. drone, a, a military drone, with a cloud surrounding it, the shape of an egg. And even though the thing's flying at over 100 miles an hour, the cloud's staying perfectly intact in the shape of an egg. And he describes how scalar energies will do that because of the fact that it's out of time. Yes. You'll see that phenomenon frequently uh, around volcanoes and even fault lines. Now, what am I getting at? Sometimes Mount Shasta, which is a, a dormant volcano, but nonetheless, many volcanoes have an upwelling of scalar energy. Okay, Scalar energy is the the driving force of volcanic activity and, and, and seismic activity. Anyway, Mount Shasta, many times you have these pancake-shaped clouds, these flat clouds that just hover on top of Mount Shasta. Now, what is that? First of all, it's, it's a stationary cloud. Right? That's an oxymoron. A stationary cloud. It simply hovers on, on top of Mount Shasta. Why? The scalar energy upwelling from Mount Shasta produces that local scalar energy environment, creating a cloud. And that cloud just stays right on top of Mount Shasta. You know, it brings up an interesting thing I want to share with you. I read a book called When God Was a Woman by Merlin Stone, which is a phenomenal book. It shows the history of the transition out of the matriarchal cultures into the patriarchal cultures and how the Levites and the Christians basically wiped out the matriarchal societies. But she talks a lot about volcanoes and shows that the name Yahweh actually means ever flowing in Sanskrit and suggests that because they were having all these powerful experiences, like there must be at least a hundred references to sacred mountains and people going to various mountains to have conversations with God. And almost all of them were volcanic mountains. So they may have been stepping into vortexes of timelessness. And when you think of scalar energy coming from zero point as ever flowing, you could see where the name Yahweh might have actually come from this experience of ever flowing timelessness. No, yeah, that's a great point. Anytime you see a mountain, you have to say, what was the force that caused that, that shift, that caused that causes it's scalar energy. So what is my point? Many times you, you'll have an animal, a dog, a cat, a horse, that senses an earthquake. And what are they sensing? They're sensing the, the upwelling, if you will, of scalar energy that precedes an earthquake. So it's scalar energy that causes an earthquake, including a mountain. If, if you've ever looked at the mountain ranges, you say, well, that's been a tremendous amount of force. What was the cause of, of that force that caused a mountain, a mountain range? Scalar energy. This is how powerful scalar energy is. It causes earthquakes. It can produce a mountain range. Now, as we discussed, a volcano or, or, or some mountains are still experiencing that upwelling of scalar energy, which really is the presence of God. So as you mentioned, there, there are some biblical passages in which God would always call his people to the mountain. Why? That's a vortex, or that's that's a concentration of scalar energy. Yeah, you know, another thing is I'm a I'm a dowser, and I've been a dowser for a long time. I I learned how to douse working on on a, a water well and exploration drilling crew when I was 19, and uh, have been dowsing ever since. And I also teach medical dowsing and use it. But dowsing is quite well documented to be. Uh, something that happens by way of scalar energy. And when you're dousing, you can actually find out information on pretty much anything if you're a good enough dowser. So my point being is, is that w when we're praying or doing any legitimate heart-centered connection to God, we are actually dousing. We're making connection with the scalar field and 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 ultimately that's probably how remote viewing takes place as well through the same process, except instead of sitting here in remote viewing, instead of sitting here asking questions about somebody's liver or kidneys, I'm actually traveling there in spirit form and observing it. 
and that's I agree with you. Dowsing is a scalar energy phenomenon. What is the animating force behind dowsing? Scalar energy. What's the animating force of clairvoyance? Scalar, scalar energy. energy. <laughs> What's the animating force of prophecy? Scalar energy. W- women have six cents. What is that? Scalar energy. Some people have the gift of pre-science, the gift of prediction, the, or a hunch. Scalar energy. Because keep in mind, scalar energy is not bound by time and space. So those who those who have this gift of, of scalar energy can see into the future, so to speak, because they're not bound by the present moment. Yes. Are you familiar with uh, Edgar Mitchell's Institute, the Institute of Noetic Science? I, I've heard of it. I, I haven't studied it. Go on. Well, they've just released a, a report of their scientific investigations into channelers, and they found very interesting things about channelers and they even identified that that the people that have more ability to channel have a a a, a gene that seems to be more activated than those that can't but they say that anybody can channel but really what they're describing is extremely in line with everything that you're saying about scalar energy they don't use the word scalar energy but um uh, i think you'd find it interesting it's it's um it's on Gaia TV right now. If you go to um, uh, what's new on Gaia, there's a section of like movies and things, and it says new on Gaia. It's like a 17-minute uh, news report from the Institute of Noetic Sciences, and it's quite fascinating uh, because I have a lot of experience with those things, so i am always got my eye open for science investigating them. And I think you'd find it fascinating based on our conversation to see what they have to say about the current scientific investigations into channeling, but they basically say anybody can do it. And, and I believe that's true. And I, I what it really, what is channeling? It's prayer. It's, it's two way prayer. Of course, of course. And noetic science is just another synonym for scalar science. So now we, we, we realize that there is a different, another definition of reality. Electromagnetic energy is real. I've, we've never doubted that. But there's a, another reality, scalar energy reality. And so there's two definitions of, of reality, scalar reality and electromagnetic reality. I'll give you a great example. Many scientists have looked at quasars, and quasars do not behave according to electromagnetic phenomena. M- many, many physicists have been just baffled by quasar activity. Well, don't be baffled. It's not electromagnetic in character. Quasars observe scalar energy patterns. Scalar energy is the fundament that drives many quasars. So it, I'm sure it doesn't behave like electricity. And don't try and fit it within that context of electromagnetic energy. There's two, en- there's two energies. It's that simple. It's that simple. Well, like Einstein said, you can't solve a problem with the same thinking that created it. So we've got to get out of this paradigm that we're in because it's extremely limiting and it's actually become very dangerous for all of us. Yeah, it, it has. You know, Einstein was, again, if, if he's the father of relativity, I would say Tessa is, is the father of absoluteness, which is scalar energy. And uh, again, if I had my druthers, the entire world would be working with scalar energy and not electromagnetic energy. You know, keep in mind that with, with electricity and magnetism, there's a, there's a top speed, a top velocity of 186,000 miles per second. That's the limit, so to speak, of electromagnetic activity. In scalar energy, it's unlimited. They're, they're, infinite. they're infinite. It's an infinite velocity. Imagine what we're saying. You could be anywhere in an instant. Did you know that symbiotica means harmony? And you're really likely to enjoy my podcast with Sherveen Jaffariah, the founder of Symbiotica. Symbiotica is an amazing company that makes excellent products to aid healing, enhance longevity, and improve performance at all levels of your being, from your spiritual practices to your athletic endeavors. I highly recommend you go to symbiotica.com and check out their top-notch organically sourced products that include excellent tasting supplements like their Synergy Vitamin B12, which elevates energy naturally, to their Sheila J Minerals, which help you better regulate your hormonal system. Their Biocharge Activated Coconut Charcoal is an excellent detox support and removes toxins and poisons from the body quickly and non-invasively. 
Their organic longevity formula is one of my friends and students' favorites. They rave about it. I really enjoy their Regenesis liposomal glutathione for its amazing antioxidant powers, which is really helpful for anyone that enjoys vaporizing tobacco and herbs like I do. They also have great immune support products, water filtration options for drinking and showering, and some cool clothing and more. When you go to C-Y-M-B-I-O-T-I-K-A dot com and use your Living 4D discount code, which is capital C, capital H, capital E, capital K, 15 on checkout, you get 15% off anything they sell and you won't be disappointed. Enjoy Symbiotica. Have you ever seen the uh, series called Masters of the Far East by Spalding? No. It's a United States investigation, and they, they became concerned with these reports that monks could do things like biolocate, walk through stone walls. And it's early 1900, so they sent a team of 13 scientists, uh, if I remember it was Tibet, but it's like a series of six books. It's very, very interesting, but these scientists were there for quite some time doing these advanced investigations with the monks. And the funny thing is is when they showed up, which they had to sail there back then, a bunch of monks were standing there waiting for them and said, oh, we knew you were coming. You know, so that was their first shock because it was supposed to be secret. But they talk about all sorts of wild and interesting things in there, such as bilocating. So what they would do to prove to the scientists, the scientists kept a logbook of every event that was going on throughout the day. And at the end of the day, they would get sit down at dinner and compare their notes. And one guy would say, well, I was talking to monk so-and-so at 12 o'clock. And then a bunch of them would say, wait a minute, that's impossible. I was talking to him over here and I was over here. And so these monks kept showing them that their sense of reality was, was limited. <laughs> And, and how is bilocation possible? Let's first define the term. Some people can appear in two places simultaneously. Okay? What is bilocation? It's a scalar energy phenomenon. Okay? Again, you're not bound by time and space. So you can be bilocated. You can be in two places at once. Now, in the electromagnetic spectrum, remember, you can only be in one place at one time. In a scalar energy environment, you can be in two places or three places or ten places simultaneously. So the only way you can bilocate is within a scalar energy environment. So those monks, if they were bilocating, had the gift of bilocation from God, and they could be in two places simultaneously. It would also describe how spiritual masters like Sai Baba are capable of manifesting things out of thin air. Because one of the things that I thought was interesting in that documentary I was referring to is he showed how matter is created by scalar energy. And he gives a very good description of how matter is. And he he says it's not particles like this typical scientific model. Uh, In other words, he shows that it's the scalar energy uh, and the way it interacts with itself that produces matter, which uh, I wish I could be more specific on exactly what he said, but I don't want to misquote him. So I'll leave it at that. But uh, uh, one of the questions I had for you is Richard Feynman calculated that there's more energy in one cubic centimeter of empty space than all the matter in the known universe. So I'm curious if you have have any idea how much of that energy would be scalar versus electromagnetic in his one cubic centimeter. That's a good point. So if, if all energy initiates a scalar, then all of that energy would be scalar at at least uh, uh, um, in its origin. In its origin, very good. The derivative of electricity and magnetism then would be a subset of that. It's it's hard to say. But he's absolutely right. Many scientists have looked at uh, deep space, you know, interstellar travel. And regardless of where they point their telescope, there's always energy. It, it, It could be a million, 10 million miles from a sun or a star. There's always energy. There's always molecular activity. There's always some type of activity. Well, where is that activity coming from? Where is that animating force? It has to be scalar energy because scalar energy never decays. It can travel throughout the universe and it never experiences any weakness. So in other words, and I've said this so many times, if you have an infinite universe, you need an infinite energy. I believe the universe is infinite. So do I. A finite energy, electromagnetic energy, cannot be responsible for an infinite 
universe. You need an infinite energy, scalar energy, to be responsible for an infinite universe. It's that simple. Well, even if you take this from a religious perspective, uh, I mean, I'll stick to Christianity because that's the most dominant belief system in our culture. There's, I don't know how many references to God as omnipresent, omniscient, omnipotent. Uh, you know, omni means all, i.e. infinite. So if, if what we're saying here is that scalar energy is the prime source from which all the other forms of energy moves, then if God is omnipotent, omnipresent, omniscient, etc., well, that would suggest that that's the nature of the basis of creation itself, because God represents first principle. One of my definitions for God is that for which there is no other. Yes, very good. And, and I agree, going back to the uncreated God. And, and you have to explain the universe in, those, in that context that there has to be a driving force. There has to be an animating force that was never created. I agree. Now, Tom, one of the things I wanted to share with you earlier that popped up into my head, but I didn't want to interrupt you, and it's popped back up, in Disclosure with Dr. Stephen Greer, in one of the episodes, I think it's maybe episode five, if not six, he actually shows, it might even be episode three, but he shows video of advanced radar from the U.S. military showing a flying saucer moving right through the Earth like the Earth doesn't even exist, which is quite a wild thing, which reason I'm bringing that up is because the only way you could do that with it would be if you're using scalar technology. Uh, I, I would agree. And <clears throat> that goes back to our earlier conversation that when you're in a scalar energy environment, you're no longer bound to that physical rigidity. It's a different physics. You know, this is so important. You know, you, you've seen many uh, angels. Angels apparently can pass through a wall. Why? Well, if an angel's composed of scalar energy, which is non-physical, the non-physical can easily pass through a wall, a brick wall. And we see that quite often. So if you're working with a anti-gravity platform, and many of these UFOs are propelled by anti-gravity, you're, you're outside of the electromagnetic dimension. You're no longer bound to some type of physical molecular rigidity. Yeah. Speaking of angels, have you ever seen or read the book, The Physics of Angels by Matthew Fox and Rupert Sheldrake? No, but I, I respect Sheldrake. Tell me about it. Uh, well, the interest, just, I'll just cut to the chase why I brought it up. I agree. I've had multiple experiences with angels conducting healing ceremonies. The first time it happened, it really shocked me because even though my mother was Christian before she became a yogi, um, I really was kind of like agnostic because the science mind of me couldn't grasp the concept of an angel. But when I had the experience of one and then I've had several since, it was very, very shocking. But Matthew Fox and Rupert Sheldrake, do you know who Matthew Fox is? No. Oh, he's a cool guy. You got to look him up. Matthew Fox was a Christian priest who got excommunicated from the church for teaching Buddhism, Taoism, and other philosophies. <laughs> and he's a very deep, cool guy. But anyhow, they basically concluded something that I really agree with from my experience with angels, that angels are flows of energy and information from source and that they appear to people pure in heart to communicate to them, to support them. Yeah, I, I agree. Angels are composed of scalar energy. Why? They're, they're part of that divine imprint, so to speak. Or divine intelligence. Yes, divine intelligence. And they are non-physical, just like scalar energy is non-physical. Yep. I'm curious, are you familiar with Ibrahim Karim and, and his system of biogeometry? I, I've, I've heard about it, but I haven't studied it. Go on. Well, right here I have a book that I think would just blow your mind, and there's many mentions of scalar energy in it. It's called Back to the... Back to a Future for Mankind, Biogeometry, Ibrahim Karim, PhD, Doctor of Science. There's two excellent interviews, uh, one with him and his daughter, Dorea, who's also a genius, 
on my podcast. The first one is about three hours long with Dr. Kareem. And based on everything we've just talked about, you're going to find it fascinating. It's a deep podcast. And believe it or not, within two weeks, it was the most downloaded podcast up till that time, which blew my mind because it's a quite deep podcast, but people obviously got it. And there's a second one with Dorea where we go through and 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 try to unpack some of the deeper stuff and get into some other stuff as well. But I think you'll find it fascinating. The reason I'm bringing it up is because he speaks of centering energy, which he studied all the major healing sites in the world and many other places. He's a very skilled, advanced dowser with many new technologies. He has produced all sorts of technologies to convert electromagnetic energies into what he calls BG3 or negative green, which he says appears at every healing site in the world. And he says this energy is centering energy. And I use his technology in, in our homes. My my wife, Angie, I've, I have two wives. You probably don't know that. But Angie is a shaman and a, and a um, uh, she's got several degrees. She's got a degree in energy medicine, a degree in biology. She did a three-year advanced training in shamanism with Michael Harner. Um, and she's also an advanced practitioner of biogeometry. And we are um, going to be, uh, right now, we're preparing to... Uh, run the biogeometry training program through the Czech Institute for the students. So Angie's be, being trained as the instructor to do that. But biogeometry is very powerful. But what it does is creates what he calls centering energy, which is the BG3 negative green, which he found all the pyramids and all the healing sites emitted very strongly. And what it does is when you enter BG3 energy, whatever's going to fasten you, such as if you have too much cortisol or you're too emotionally aroused will slow down and whatever's depressed in you will speed up and balance right out. And it's an extremely powerful healing technology. I've seen Angie have people call her in an emergency because somebody in the family is in a terminal care ward dying and she has done biogeometry on them from our home using biogeometry technology, which is also scalar. And within a short period of time, they're walking out of the hospital and have had radical improvements. So I was asking if, if, if you'd heard of that, because it's, it's a very along the lines of everything that you've been talking about. And his book has several references to scale our energy. Uh, so I just wanted to share that for people if they want to look into that. Sure. Let, let, let me add to that. <clears throat> we know that prayer or intention can heal that we can pray for somebody and that person can heal, or we can have a prayer group and we can experience a healing from that prayer group. Or that's scalar energy now. Or some people have healing hands. They can lay their hands upon you and they can heal you. Well, that's not electricity. That's scalar energy. If somebody has healing hands, that's scalar energy, scalar light emanating from their hands. So we, we see so many applications and so many examples of scalar energy. And all we have to do is simply admit that there's two dimensions, there's two energies, scalar energy and electromagnetic energy. And then we'll, we'll make some advance, we'll, we'll make some progress here. You, know, you, you can't fit the universe into the electromagnetic box. That's only one explanation. There's two explanations. There's two energies, hence there's two explanations for reality. Yeah, I like that. Do you feel there's a correlation between scalar energy and the placebo effect in, in medicine? Many people, yes. Many people. <clears throat> because what you can conceive, you can achieve. Yes. Yes. Therefore, the nocebo effect, which means you have a negative effect, would be the inappropriate use of scalar energy. Right. Exactly. Exactly. Negativity. You know, and that's, you, you've heard this from so many health coaches, from so many, uh, business coaches, et cetera, think positive thoughts. It really comes down to a choice. You can be positive or you can be negative. Now, that, that doesn't mean that you negate reality. You know, as, as the saying is, it is what it is. You have to deal with the world as it is. But why not be positive and try and, and make an improvement rather than be negative and, and seek to the destruction of, of society? Yes, I, I post personally, my philosophy is that all challenges are doorways to possibilities. Yes, yes, 
you know, my greatest failures have been my greatest successes. That's the way I look at it. Well, I, I've coached thousands of people in my career. I've been doing this a very long time. And uh, one of the things I say to people, because, you know, people hate change and they hate dealing with a crisis of any type and they often drug themselves to death instead of dealing with it. But I ask them, if I could wave a magic wand and remove all the painful experiences that you've ever had versus waving a magic wand and removing all the great times you've ever had, such as birthday parties and celebrations, which would leave you with less knowledge? And everyone, every single person said, I wouldn't want you to take my negative experiences away because I would probably have so little knowledge, I wouldn't even know who I am anymore. So I think when we look at the situation the world's in right now, instead of getting freaked out and stressed out, if we say this is our opportunity to walk through the door and really participate in bringing the world back into harmony, and having empathy for those that are too lost and confused to realize that they can participate instead of just getting sucked into the vacuum of greed and hubris and, and power figures trying to uh, overstep their rights as human beings, then we all can really participate in the healing of the planet and the healing of each other and the healing of the world culture. Yeah, I agree. If, if 7.9 billion people acted together or, or 7.9 billion people perform one good function, one good deed a day, it'd be a different world. You know, you, you've seen some successful companies, corporations, 50 people, 100 people, 1,000 people. When you have 1,000 people working together as a coordinated whole, working together in this synergistic fashion, that, that corporation can, or church or, or movement can produce incredible results. Well, we have a corporation, 7.9 billion people. And shame on us for fighting. Shame on us for, for, for not working together. If 7.9 billion people work together as a coordinated whole, we would have solved so many problems by now. Absolutely. And that, that there is the solution, isn't it? Yeah, there is. It's, it's us. We have such potential. Absolutely. I mean, even in the Bible, Jesus says, anything I can do, you can do better. Exactly. Why did he say that? Because he knew that mankind would evolve to the point that eventually, through faith and through application, they could do greater things than, than what he did. He was limited back then. People had limited faith, limited knowledge. We don't have limited knowledge today. We, we need unlimited faith today. Yes. My understanding of scalar waves is they don't travel anywhere. I'm curious, if this is true, then how are you able to transmit scalar light to someone at a distance? Now, I, of course, I, I have, uh, I'm asking this question for the public, but uh, I wanted to let you answer that because somebody that's critical thinking might be finding themselves in a roadblock right now. Okay, remember, I, I, I work with scalar energy only. Now, when I work with people, I actually take their photograph. This is my photograph, and I place it in an instrument. The photograph then is immersed in a scalar energy force field in which everything is instantaneous communication. So you don't have to come to my instrument. Your photograph is you. And once I place your photograph inside my instrument, there's instantaneous communication. It's no point A, point B. It's as if you were inside my instrument. There's no time and space. And once you are inside my instrument, I can tell my instrument to, to break down the viruses and the bacteria that it sees. I can tell my instrument to balance your seven chakras or to create nutrients. And I do all of that by way of a photograph of a person. Everybody, he's offering 15 days for all of you for free. you got nothing to lose. You can go right to... Tom's website, load up a photo, and believe me, nothing bad's going to happen and lots of good could happen. Um, you've kind of described how the photographic assessment works. Uh, I've used photographs for distance healing many times, and uh, I've done distance healings right through the web. Uh, so, you know, our, our, the photographic image of us is light, and it's carrying, like you said, our energy signature. So we have the ability to communicate with a person. This is why so many, for example, psychics that do work for the police department want a sample of hair or blood or 
something because they're picking up their energetic signature, which is like a GPS coordinates, really. Yes, exactly, exactly. My predecessor, a man by the name of Galen Hieronymus, and I, I took many of his inventions and perfected them. Galen Hieronymus was employed by the United States Army, and he was asked to pinpoint soldiers on a, to- a, a on a map on a, a, a map and aerial photography uh, took maps of a, of a, a field, so to speak. And Galen Hieronymus was able to pinpoint where the U.S. soldiers were on that map by way of his instrument. So what am I getting? You can pinpoint a person on a photograph, okay? whether it's by a drone photograph or some type of aerial photograph. This is the reach of scalar energy. You can find anybody in the world by way of their photograph. Yes, and and uh, it's very clear from uh, Dr. Stephen Greer's discussions that I talked about on his series Disclosure, because he talks about interacting with people in these very top secret programs that are even beyond the CIA and the president. And one of the guys that he talked to said to him, was warning him about what he says. And he said, uh, he told Dr. Greer, they don't need a microphone. If you can talk, they can hear you no matter where you're at which is a strong implication of the use of scalar energy technology. Yeah, there, there was a man, Thomas Moray, he developed scalar energy instruments, and he could hear people at a distance, miles away, with his scalar energy device. And that, that goes to show that scalar energy is, is within a dimension where you can pick up sound, scalar energy sound, and there's no diminution of signal. He could pick up uh, voices miles away. Well, well, that that's not possible by way of electromagnetic energy. So somewhere in that scalar energy dimension, you can pick up a voice. You don't need a microphone or an amplifier. Well, when I'm remote viewing, I'm talking to beings in other dimensions regularly, just like I'm talking to you. And they've taught me a lot of stuff. So uh, it's, you know, for a lot of people that aren't ready to hear this kind of stuff, people like me and possibly you sound a bit nutty. but you know, if you have judgments about things that you have no knowledge of, then that's not a very healthy way to be. That's called closed mindedness. And that gets you in a lot of trouble (laughs) in your life. Because one thing we know for sure that as Buddha said, if there's one universal law, it's impermanence, which means everything's always changing. And people that are closed minded don't change. They don't grow with the times. They don't evolve. And that's dangerous. Yes. You know, sadly, some people have that spirit of pride and they don't want to learn or, or they do not want to be taught. And that's a shame. Only God knows everything. So if there's no shame in saying you don't know. Just study, learn, change. Hi, everybody. Do you guys want to know one of my secret weapons that helps me avoid being sick or feeling run down? It's Organifi Immunity. Organifi Immunity is a super high quality certified organic drink mix that provides daily immune support and supports overall immunity. Organifi Immunity contains whole food vitamins C and D, whole food zinc, mushroom beta glycans, and provides only natural sweetness. Not only will you support your immune system, but you'll also get on the go superfoods in a delicious orange blend that is great for you and your kids and everyone will love it. My family and I love it, and it's easy as tearing off the top of the package and mixing it with high-quality drinking water, and you can rest a little easier knowing that you're enhancing your immune system, which is probably a good idea now that so many people are spending so much time indoors, breathing indoor air, and lacking sun exposure. Why not enjoy a little immune insurance while getting certified organic nutrients, superfoods, and great taste that's quick, easy, and effective? To get your Organifi immunity and shop their amazing product line with your Living 4D discount, Go to O-R-G-A-N-I-F-I dot com and save 20% on any and all of their products using the code capital C, capital H, capital E, capital K, 20. That's check 20 during checkout. Enjoy Organifi. I noticed on your website that you have programs for a variety of things from fat loss to male and female programs and several others. 
and I saw all sorts of vitamins and standard biochemical applications, but I'm wondering, do you have to make any specific adjustments to how you tune or apply your scalar light technologies for people with different kinds of ailments? No, and, and that's a good question. I, I work under these standardized uh, uh, guidelines. And why do I say that? Well, energy is, is standardized. Scalar energy is fundamental. So when I'm working with people, it's, it's the same approach no matter what your background in life. I'm going to make this very clear. As you'll, you'll see how profound this is. If I take a photograph of, of a microbe, this is a photograph of the herpes virus. I place this photograph inside my instrument. Everything is light. I only work with light. My instrument will look at this photograph of herpes, understand its molecular compositions, its atomic composition, it, understand its, its psychic uh, constitution, et cetera, et cetera, and then will send the necessary energy into my body to break down this molecular structure. So let me repeat. This is how simple and straightforward scalar energy is. Take a photograph of a microbe, place it in the instrument. The instrument will look at that microbe and will eradicate it, no matter if you're a person or you're an animal. And it's a standardized approach. Why? Because energy is fundamental. Whether you're, no matter what your background, whether you're a person, an animal, or a plant, the energy is applied to all life forms. Well, that brings up an interesting question because I've studied biology enough and uh, have worked with countless cases, uh, cases of parasite infection and have a whole program on it. And philosophically and, and from the natural sciences, everything out there, viruses or otherwise, whether we like them or not, are actually part of the harmony of nature. They all have a function. For example, people think mosquitoes are bad because they bite and make them itch. But if you study mosquitoes, you'll find that in their larva state, they actually eat the impurities out of the water and purify the water they're in. So there's an example of something we think of as negative that actually has a function in nature. So based on what you just said, that tells me that you must be using your own intention so that you're directing that to knock the herpes virus out of that individual because what would stop that from knocking it out of the entire sphere of nature? That, that's a good point. Now, in order for me to direct this herpes virus, I, it, it has to be told where to visit. So I actually have to take a person's photograph and place it right next to the herpes virus. Okay, good. This is what I've observed with my instrument. I can direct this energy anywhere. I could go, I could go to a school and take a photograph of 100 school kids and the energy of herpes would enter into the photographs or the, the psychic being, so to speak, of 100 school kids. Or I could just take one photograph and send the herpes energy into myself by one photograph. Now, let me, let me advance that. If I turn this around, here's a collage. So if I place this collage right next to the herpes virus inside my instrument. Then these 30 people would receive the energy from herpes instantaneously. And you would essentially eradicate, cure, remove the herpes virus in 30 people right. in, instantaneously. Now, there's, there's, there's a corollary. If I take a million photographs and place them inside my instrument, then a million people would be treated with the herpes virus. For, treated for it, you mean? Yes. Yeah. Now, from my work with the Rife technology, I'm going to bring up a a sort of a situation. I'd like to hear how you respond to it. One of the things about the Rife generators is because Royal Raymond Rife was actually taking cancer cells and, and, and doing biopsies of the cells so he could get the frequency rate of those pathogenic cells, which he would then match with an electromagnetic. Uh, well, he was using crystallography and other things, but he would match that frequency, which would destroy the cell, just like a singer matching the frequency of a crystal vase and destroying it. The point that I was making is, is that when they produced rife machines that they had on the market, one of the things that they found, and, and a lot of the people using them found, is because they had a list of frequencies. So they'd say herpes is this frequency, ringworm is this frequency, uh, ascaris worm is this frequency. But what they found out was in some people, it actually magnified their problems. It didn't heal them. It made them worse. 
because they didn't have an adequate um, assessment of that individual and or the organism. So how how do you uh, protect yourself against generating frequencies that might actually trigger off a magnification of a problem? That's that's a perfect uh, question, and, and I'm glad you asked it. Now, my instruments, I never deviate from the process. It's the same process every day. And if I want to eradicate, destroy, remove a pathogen, I always use the photograph. Now, remember, a photograph is a light signature. I'm not. I'm not using human interpretation to define the herpes virus. This is an actual photograph of the herpes virus. So I keep it at the fundamental level. I allow a scalar energy instrument to ascertain the scalar energy environment of a pathogen and then negate this scalar energy signal all by way of the interpretation of the photograph, not by human interpretation. So I'm saying this now, and here's a bold statement, but I hold by it. Anytime I place a photograph of a microbe in my instrument, without exception, I can guarantee the destruction of that microbe. Because the definition of a microbe is the photograph, and my instrument will will break apart, transmute any microbe I tell it to. This is the definitive, and this is the guaranteed approach to microbial infection. Yes. Now, one of the questions I have uh, because I've seen this in research and there's several research papers out there. Uh, for example, one scientist experimenting with uh, parasites found that he infected himself with hookworm and his asthma went away. But when he killed the hookworm, his asthma came back. And there's a number of research papers showing that sometimes we harvest parasites because they actually have a biological effect that's protective and is somehow aiding our immune system. And, and, and there, these papers are, are good science. And I, and I understand this because I, you know, I was raised on a farm and we had infections and I've studied this and I've spoke to Phil Callahan, who was the first one to scientifically isolate paramagnetic energy. He built the first instrument to measure paramagnetic energy. And he told me that anytime you're dealing with parasite infections in living organisms. You're almost always dealing with an imbalance of the energies in the environment, such as food or such as too much toxicity, and that the parasites are are there to either dismantle the organism because it's not healthy enough or try to balance it in some way. But he said all you had to do was clean the environment up and feed the animals what they were supposed to be eating, and then the immune systems would kick in. But how would you? How would you be protecting yourself against knowing if someone says, okay, I've got such and such a thing like a hookworm infection, but you knock it out and all of a sudden their asthma comes back. How do you determine whether or not you're actually throwing a natural process out of balance? That's a great point. So I have to rely upon the energy. Again, I'm not the prime mover here. The energy is. And I let Energy decide upon the state of homeostasis. Okay, so you're letting the intelligence in the energy do the thinking. Exactly. Now, now that I, now that we're going down this route again, I use photographs of, of microbes to break apart, transmute, destroy a microbe, and then I use photographs. This this is vitamin B six. This is B six magnified. I use photographs of vitamins and minerals to tell the instrument to recreate that landscape, to recreate that molecular structure inside the body, peroxidine, B6. So what am I getting at? There's no human interpretation. And this is the beauty of my work. So if I keep it with light, light is fundamental, light is supreme intelligence, supreme energy, I get out of the way and I let light, scalar light, do all of the work and all of the interpreting. This is what I love about my work. There is no room for human error. Human error has been eliminated. Uh, I'm curious, how much would it cost to buy one of your scalar machines? I'm sure it would be ridiculously expensive, but I'm just curious, is that something in the future you're working on? Uh, I'm not going to sell instruments for this explicit reason. Um, The energy could be used negatively. Yeah. The energy could be be used as a weapon. And um, you and I have discussed this previously. I will not even patent these instruments. I don't trust the patent office. So this 
this suppressed technology, I'm going to give it to mankind. I want people to freely work with us. I'm looking for a grassroots movement and, and mark my word, people. I'm not in bed with government, big business. There's no board of directors that tells me what to do and what not to do. I don't have any financial ties to anybody. So I've, I've never encumbered myself with those uh, pitfalls, with, with those trap doors, so to speak. So what I'm getting at is I'm going to keep this as a grassroots movement. I want to heal people for the glory of God and work with me. This is grassroots. I, I am not going to allow what happened to Tessa happen to me. Tessa became financially dependent upon J.P. Morgan. Yeah, bad news. Okay, I'm not going to be financially dependent upon anybody, and I will not share this technology with nefarious forces. Yeah, thank you for that. Uh, and, and hopefully you're protecting yourself from them taking it from you because they don't like people that heal people. I, I know. It's, it's just it's, there's too much money to be lost and there's too much power for them to lose. Well, this is the world that I envision to be able to liberate mankind by way of this technology. We're going to do that. Okay. And with, with God's blessing and with help from people like you in this listening audience. So if this resonates with you, contact me. Um, this is real. Everything I've stated, I, you know, I've not embellished. There's no hyperbole. We have the easy way to break down to negate microbes. Imagine what that means to mankind. Yes. And, and, and you know, the other thing, too, is as we've been discussing, these technologies have been around for quite some time. When you study the history of them, I've got several books documenting these and similar types of technologies. We've mentioned uh, Royal Raymond Reif, there was Keeley, there's there's many of them. And unfortunately, a lot of them had their technologies confiscated by the U.S. government, which ended up in the hands of the U.S. military, which uh, I think are being used against us uh, right now. And, and so, um, which brings my next question, in your short article on the use of scalar light for the treatment of COVID-19, uh, I looked at, can you share if that scalar light procedure works better at any given stage of the infection, or is it something that you can use anytime because of your uh, reliance on the intelligence of the energy to do the work? Again, when we're working with scalar energy, it's fundamental energy. I'm going to hold up this, this photograph of herpes, but I'll use this as, as a way of analogy with the COVID um, virus. This photograph of the herpes virus has DNA that's photographed. And my instrument will look at that composition of DNA and just break it apart, transmute it. Now, whether that's a photograph of herpes, HIV, COVID-19, or the Ebola virus, it doesn't matter. There's no human interpretation. The instrument does what I tell it to do. So a photograph of a virus instructs the instrument to simply to break down the nucleic acid of that virus. It's that simple. And you only can do this now readily with the scalar energy instrument to break down the nucleic acid of any virus. I hold to that statement. So everybody that's ever approached me, whether they had herpes, HIV, or even COVID, um, after I work with them, they feel better. And some of them have gone on to have tests performed. And lo and behold, there's no herpes virus. The, the, the herpes virus is absent. Now, um, that's that's the new science here that we're speaking of. And we'll, we'll see how the world accepts this new science moving forward. Yes. I have had a great time dialoguing with you and, and, and learning a lot more about scalar technologies and scalar energy. You've really inspired me to go back into my library and dig into some of my old books that I read years ago and, and even some of my new ones. Um, I've got a great book by, I believe it's Len Horowitz, called uh, DNA, the sacred spiral. spiral. And it, it talks about scalar technologies, and it also talks a lot about what's going on in the world right now, how long it's been going on, who's been behind it, how they've been confiscating technologies, using them against us. And I'll try to make sure that one ends up in the show notes. It's a very comprehensive book. Um, are there any final comments that you would like to share with the listeners? And where can people learn more about your work and, and get their free trial? First of all, thank you for the opportunity to speak with you today. And uh, I thank the listening audience for listening to this uh, talk. Uh, hopefully it wasn't too long-winded. No, it was awesome. 
<laughs> Thank you. My website is scalarlight.com. Anybody in the world can visit the website. And once again, you're going to email us your photograph. When you do so, we're going to work with you, treat your photograph for 15 days. We're going to break apart, transmute the microbes, the germs. We're going to balance your chakras. And the third modality, we're able to deliver micronutrients. And all of this is done by the quantum field recognized by your photograph. So scalarlight.com, visit the website, test it for yourself. Upload your photograph, and, and you judge how effective this quantum healing is. Absolutely. Uh, can't get better that, you know, the proof's always in the pudding, as they say. I've got a question for you. It looks like there's a slide image that keeps popping up on the wall behind you. Are you broadcasting something on the wall back there? No, no. I'm oh, maybe it's, just a, maybe it's just a distortion coming might through be the a, internet. Yeah, it might be a reflection. It looks like um like a graph of an EKG every now and then, like a series of EKG readings, and it just pops up spontaneously. There it is right now. It's wild. I think it's just might be light interference. But uh, <laughs> did I hear you say your website? I'm sorry. Scalarlight.com. And uh, share it with friends and family. We, we want to treat the world for free by way of their photographs. How do you... You must have a lot of people doing this. How do you get these things all into the machine one at a time? You know, uh, uh, I'm going to mention this. It's, we have a great IT team, and we miniaturize the photographs. Oh, I see. So you put people together. Yeah, so every, everything is miniaturized. You can miniaturize the photographs, and it's all computer-driven. It's, it's, there's a lot of technology behind this. Awesome. Yeah, you know, biogeometry, Ibrahim Karim uh, has... Uh, various necklaces that you can wear. And he has miniaturized the bioenergy signatures for each of the gland and organ systems in the body and many others that deal with environmental stuff. So it's all actually encoded into this necklace, but it's a very advanced technology. It looks just like a piece of jewelry, but it's actually very, very advanced and very cool. So, well, well Tom, thank you. And I'm, I'm, thank really, you. I'm grateful that you're doing what you're doing. I love you know, opening the box, expanding and and giving ourselves a chance to become aware of new technologies. And the fact that you're offering a people a free trial on this is so beautiful because even a skeptic has a great opportunity to test it out. You know, it's like, okay, well, if you don't believe it, then try it. It's like a lot of people don't think prayer works. And I say, well, how many times have you tried? Usually they go, oh, I wouldn't even bother. I'm like, well, then you're then you're not interested in learning. You're just interested in being dogmatic, and the world's already got plenty of that. Let's try something a little more creative. <laughs> I, I agree with you. I, I, the glass is always half full, as far as I'm concerned. Let's let's try and make this a better world. Yes, right now is a very good time to to do that. So, what a great conversation! Thank you all of you for joining. Me. I hope you enjoyed this conversation with Tom Palladino as much as I did. I hope you enjoy testing the technology as much as I'm going to and my whole family. I, I'm always open for anything that gives me a chance to be healthier, more conscious, more capable, more loving, and more um, inspired to be the change in the world. And this is one opportunity we can't refuse. It's free. And so uh, thank you to my sponsors for all the beautiful products that you share and for your sustainable practices that are earth-friendly and exactly what we need to be doing in the world. Thank you to my listeners for anything you buy from the sponsors because a little commission goes to me and the podcast to help fund the podcast so that I can take the time out of my extremely busy schedule to find amazing people like Tom Palladino and share them with you in free healing. Aho, great spirit. It is done. It is done. It is done. See you next time. Thank you. Thank you for listening to Living 4D with Paul Check and today's guest, Tom Palladino. To experience the benefits of Scalar Light for yourself, go to scalarlight.com and sign up for your free trial to get 15 days of free Scalar Light sessions. You can also find more information on the website on specific programs catering to different needs. Go to scalarlight.com. That's S C A L A R. L I G H T dot com. Follow Paul on Instagram at Paul.check, on Twitter at Paul Check, 
or on his YouTube podcast channel, youtube.com forward slash living 4 D with Paul Check. Watch more on Paul's blog at paulchecksblog.com and get your free subscription to Check videos and more at the Check Institute's new media site, chekiva.com. And remember, you can read the show notes and find links to the resources mentioned in this episode at checkinstitute.com forward slash podcast. 